In this lesson, we're looking at speciation and macroevolution. We're going to do all these three here, and we're going to leave this for a second lesson. So let's start by contextualizing our understanding of evolution, right? We know that evolution is the change in genetic composition of a population during successive generations, and it may actually result in the development of a new species. Now, at a visible, you know, immediate level, microevolution occurs when there's a small change uh, of allele frequencies. It's accumulating within a species or a population. So the types of alleles that exist in a gene pool of a species change, but not so much that they become a new species, just enough that we can see a variety of phenotypes. Now, eventually, a section of a population can accrue so many changes that they've actually turned into an entirely new species, and this is known as speciation, okay? And where this speciation occurs to develop um, a collection of new taxonomic groups, this is known as macroevolution. So microevolutionary changes accumulate over time and eventually lead to speciation and macroevolution. Now, if we're going to talk about speciation, we have to review our understanding of what species actually is or what the word means. And remember that there's multiple definitions of this word. And this is because any one definition is hard to apply to all organisms at any one context. So, for example, we can look at a biological definition here, which is all about um, interbreeding and having viable offspring. But, you know, does this actually work for organisms that reproduce asexually? You know, what definition fits for them? So the evolutionary concept of species is defined as a single lineage of ancestor descendant populations of organisms which maintains its identity from other such lineages and has its own evolutionary tendencies and historical fate, which sounds all a little bit grim. So this concept is more inclusive to asexual organisms and interestingly to extinct species where the biological species concepts couldn't really apply because if they've died out as a population, they obviously can't produce uh, viable offspring, but that doesn't preclude them from being a separate taxonomic group. So if we look at it through this lens, you know, a species is genetically unique. It means that the genes are, aren't flowing back and forth between different species. So Technically, each species began as a population, has accumulated these genetic changes over time, and has split from their ancestral lineage and become an isolated species. Now, for a population to be split or isolated enough to limit the gene flow and accrue so many changes, there's got to be some kind of mechanism at play to separate them. Now, things like spatial barriers, like ge uh, geographical, uh, physical displacement, it might be reproductive changes or temporal and timing issues that can separate these populations. And these become barriers to interbreeding, right? And that splits up the original population's gene pool. Then those separated populations, they face different um, selection pressures in new environments, they accrue changes so that the phenotypes that work best for that environment, you know, happen due to natural selection, and then voila, speciation occurs. Now, there's lots of ways these mechanisms of isolation can be classified. Um, they all influence how gene flow occurs across the population, and we'll be grouping them into these four categories here. And our focus, um, based you know solely on the syllabus, are those ones that are geographic, temporal, and reproductive, which exist both in behavioral and morphological. Another way of grouping these mechanisms is to consider when the isolation occurs in relation to reproduction. So mechanisms can be pre-zygotic; they occur before the reproduction actually happens happens, so they're actually preventing fertilization occurring in the first place, or they can be post-zygotic occurring after the reproduction has already taken place. So it might be that the gamete or the zygote, uh, you know, actually die off, or that the sterility of the hybrid offspring that is produced, so they're not actually viable offspring in terms of being um, able to have children or able to have offspring later on. So uh, all the ones we're looking at are going to be pre-zygotic. Now, spatial isolation refers to the physical space which a population obviously occupies. So if we're talking ecological, it may be that populations are the same species. Uh, they live in separate habitats or microhabitats, and they never meet, so they never breed. Geographical isolation refers to there being some kind of physical barrier in the way of populations actually meeting. So it might be that a river has changed course and cut off populations. It might be that seeds settle and colonize on a new island. Um, the water level drops, something like that, and that isolates marine species. So in the same vein, we're talking habitat fragmentation um, because of a road or tree felling or something like that, and natural disasters lead to similar outcomes, right? Populations being out, uh, isolated. <laughs> 
Now, temporal refers to timing. So temporal mechanisms of isolation refer to the prevention of breeding due to some kind of mismatch schedule, you might say, right? So animals that are nocturnal, animals that breed in different seasons or in different cycles, they don't overlap and that prevents them from mating at all. So flowering plants have different times of the year where they can pollinate. Um, there's a genus of cicada that spend heaps of years underground um, as juveniles and they actually emerge to breed, but different species spend different amounts of time underground. So somewhere between 13 to 17 years and then they emerge again. So if their cycles you know, differ between species and their schedules don't line up, there's no breeding happening and therefore those subpopulations become isolated. Now given that we're talking about populations end up being reproductively isolated, when we say behavior mechanisms, they are stemming from basically from courtship rituals. So this could be anything from dances and displays, gifts, mating calls, um, but all of them need to be recognized to be actually leading to reproduction. So if mates of the same species don't recognize the behavior, they're less likely to pay attention to it and therefore they're not going to mate, right? So frogs and insects and birds have really uh, extremely species specific mating calls and some mammals emit scents and pheromones, some birds and some insects have dances, but all of which need to be recognized as some kind of call for mating. Now, regardless of if all of these mechanisms are recognized or managed, if the anatomical structures associated with reproduction aren't compatible, then ultimately it's going to stop fertilization from occurring anyway, right? Um, it might be that reproductive organs don't fit together to deposit gametes, like a lock and key mechanism in some bugs, um, and certain body types of dog breed, just you physically can't mate them, right? Um, flowering plants also sort of uh, evolve only certain structures that will allow specific insect pollinators. And the same can be said for gametes. If the gametes are incompatible when they meet, there's going to be no fertilization. Now, all these mechanisms of isolation can affect how gene flow occurs in the population. Now, at best, the separation can interrupt the gene flow for a short period of time. At worst, it can completely eliminate the gene flow and isolate that section of the population. So essentially, regardless of how a population is isolated, speciation is really likely to occur because new selection pressures are leading to new phenotypes. And that's going to lead to change in genotype frequency and boom, new species.